everybody, good morning and uh, welcome to this week's Learn with Lorna. As you can probably already tell, I uh, have got something of a sore throat and something coming on, so I have a glass of water next to me and I will do my best, but I'm sure we'll be absolutely fine. Hi Penny. So welcome to uh, this week's Learn with Lorna. This is number 82 in the series and we'll be looking at the subject of farming records. My name is Lorna. I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the Highland Archive Service. We have, as those of you who watch regularly will know, four archive centres across the Highlands. We have the Highland Archive and Registration Centre in Inverness, Nucleus, the Nucle Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick, Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre in Portree, and Loch Abbot Archive Centre in Fort William. And together the four of them make up the Highland Archive Service. This series, uh, as some of you will, will know, I'm sure some of you will be along, able to say along with me, uh, is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. I hope uh, you enjoyed last week's we were looking at the food of food for rich and poor and um, thank you for your comments on that it was really lovely to get uh, to get some comments uh, about how moving some of the stories were and the differences um, of the quality and, and quantity of food depending on where you sat in the class structure so uh, thank you for that if you didn't watch it or if you want to watch any of them back all the previous Learn with Lorna's can be seen on our YouTube channel, so please do go and have a look there. This week we're continuing the theme of food and drink, uh, going right to the very hub of the of the subject, looking at farming. I'm not going to cover um, the move from runrig farming to enclosed field systems or the impact of the clearances, because I think we've, we've touched on that in previous episodes, but what I wanted to do was to look at the the modern farming collections that we hold in our offices. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be doing today. According to the National Farmers Union, 80% um, of Scotland is currently under agricultural production. 80%. There are 67,000 people roughly directly employed in agriculture and another approximately 360 360,000 people's jobs depend on agriculture. Um, if you are one of those people, please do shout. It was quite funny when I was preparing for this. My colleague Anne, who some of you may know, our family historian, comes from a farming family. And so I kept having to go to her uh, for to check terminology and check things because at the time that Anne's family were running farms, my family were cleaning chimneys in London. So... Uh, Maybe we'll do another talk about that sometime. So farming, of course, hugely important to Scotland. Nearly three billion pounds worth of produce each year coming out of our agricultural sector. And that's dairy, arable, uh, beef, sheep farming uh, and so on. We hold lots of farming collections across our offices um, and, cro and records relating to crofting as well, which is not not the same thing but there are elements of um elements of similarity which I'll, I'll talk about we hold records both relating to individual farms and farmers and also to farming societies and farmers clubs and things like that what kind of records do we have well for individual farms we have things like minute books correspondence um sorry forgive me i've got that the wrong way around for clubs and societies, we have things like minute books, correspondence and letter books. For individual farms, we have a very wide range of documents. Items to do with finance, so the, the um, financial running of a farm, so ledgers, cash books, expenditure reports, uh, account books, bills, wages, things like that. There are also items to do with farm management and admin, so statistical information uh, about the amount of crop planted, things like that, maps of field boundaries, uh, correspondence, inventories of furnishings within the farms. And then items to do, of course, with the, that, the very um, 
heart of, of what a farm does, so items to do with livestock and crop management. So these can be inventories of stock, um, information about sales and routes, work journals, uh, my favourites, diaries, which we'll come on to shortly. And then, of course, items to do with the farmers and their families. And there is crossover between those as well. And there are things like leases and tenancy agreements, uh, family diaries and so on. And so today we're going to have a look at examples of these from different offices and also have a look at where uh, farming and the agricultural year and the importance of the agricultural calendar appears in other collections as well. So I mentioned that we hold documents relating to the finances of individual farms, so we're going to start there. One of the biggest farming collections we hold at the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness is D237, which is the records of Ballantrad Farm and the Forsyth family. And you'll maybe remember me talking about Ian Forsyth, uh, one of the members of that farming family who went off to serve in the First World War. I spoke a bit about his story. And of course, all of that is intertwined. The, the lives and the reality of the families, the things that they dealt with and how that impacted um, and how that impacted uh, the, the, the running of the farm, the production of, of things on the farm. So I'm going to start with uh, Ballantrad. Now Ballantrad is just outside Invergordon and it was run by the Forsyth family as I mentioned. First of all they were tenants of the farm and then proprietors and altogether they were there for around 100 years, from 1888 through to 1990. The Ballantrad Farm Collection includes a, a wide variety of documents, including some of those financial records I've mentioned. And among the financial records are cash books. And the cash books reveal a really uh, interesting insight into the expenditure of the farm. So for instance, the, the entries for January and February 1897 include payments to subscriptions to, for, uh, for subscriptions to societies, such as the Clydesdale Horse Society, payment for stock, so for instance, 78 pounds, 15 shillings and five pence for cattle to Petri, uh, Petrie and Co. 19 pounds, 16 shilling to the Reverend D. Stewart for 22 sheep. So we start to get an idea of the costs. And when I come on to talk about another one, I'll give you a comparison to, uh, to present day, see what the costs are. These expenditure books also show payments for labour costs. So in that same year, that uh, that same month, January, February 1897, the labour cost was 12 pence, 12 shillings and nine and a half pence. The cash book also includes payments relating to items that the family needed. So those things obviously are to the labour on the farm, the cattle, the, the sheep that I've mentioned. But the cash books also contain information relating to the family themselves. So there are payments to watchmakers and shoe repairers. And I think that's just completely indicative of any of you who are from a far farming family will, will know. Uh, this this may be this may be controversial. Throw this at me if you've got other opinions. But I think maybe more than any other industry, being a farmer or working on the land is, um, it's not a job. It's it's so intrinsic and central to every part of you, and you can really see that in these collections that the whole thing uh, comes together as a a way of life. In this particular collection, we can use these expenditure books. Uh, the cash books and then we can cross reference them with receipts and bills because we have both of those so that gives us a bit more detail about what the payments were for so for instance the 19 pounds nine shillings that i mentioned um for the shoemaker we can find out from the receipts that that's to uh, an a urquhart shoemaker in invergordon and it was for patching shoes repairing slippers and fixing galoshes so you can see there the mix of slippers for the house and then patching and repairing galoshes um, and boots for working on the farm. The cash books of May of that year for Ballantrad also record payments to other businesses such as A, a. Munro and Sons of Scotsburn and the Highland Railway Company for carriage of stock. So you can use these collections to not only learn about the running of the farm but also to learn about other businesses and industries in the surrounding area. These books also reveal details about the external help brought in to assist with work on the farm. 
So, for instance, there's a payment to a J. Thompson for two days of threshing, which is the separating uh, the grain from the chaff. And when we cross-reference that to the receipts collection, we find that J. Thompson was John Thompson, threshing mill proprietor in Allness, and he had threshed wheat on Ballantrad on the 7th and 8th of May at a cost of £2. And incidentally, <clears throat> that wasn't paid until the 26th of May, and it has a little note on the bottom of it from Mr Forsyth, which says, excuse me, I overlooked this account. But I don't really think much of that delay of just a, a couple of weeks, because there's also a bill in there from Andrew Ross and Sons, who were distillers in Delney in Rossshire. Uh, it reveals that on the 6th of December, 1895, Ross and Sons supplied Ballantrad Farm with 11 and three quarter gallons of fine Highland malt whiskey. Uh, and that bill wasn't paid for well over a year. <laughs> it was paid on the 1st of September, 1897. And our one of our previous archivists, Colin, always used to say, I wonder if they drank right to the bottom of it to make sure it was fine before they paid for it. The financial records for Ballantrad also give information about people working on the farm and what payment they received for their work. So, for instance, the wages sheets of 1898 shows that in addition to the £34 that the Forsyths paid John MacDonald for his year's work, they also gave him 12 bowls of meal, 4 tonnes of coal, 1 load of firewood and 1,200 yards of potatoes. And we can see this from the opposite perspective of the person receiving the payment if we have a look at our Hugh Lyle collection that we hold in Nucleus. If any of you follow the Nucleus Facebook page, you may well be familiar with Hugh Lyle. Or if you just live in Caithness, you may well remember Hugh Lyle. Uh, he was a crofter in Brabster in Caithness in the mid 20th century. And we hold his diaries, letters, postcards and other material uh, created by him and his brother Bob. Hugh's diaries give information about the farming year, both on his own land, on the croft, um, but also uh, records of payments that he received for work undertaken on other people's land, so how much money he received for helping on other people's crofts. And this is typical of the way um, most crofts were operated. So Hugh and his brother would often work as contractors and for big jobs such as harvesting or threshing, then these would be often completed by people from across the area, from crofts, from farms, pitching in to support each other and going round each one to make sure that it was completed on each um, in each particular location. So a very close community. And again, I, as I said, I don't come from a farming family, but I get the feeling that that's, it's very still a, a close community that will step out to help in periods of um, haymaking and harvesting and lambing and so on. At the end of each week, uh, Hugh's diaries are rounded off with a summary of his incomings and outgoings for that week. So he will record how much he's been paid and whether he's going to the bank at the end of the week. He details all the money he needs for his messages, for his shopping, and the number of gallons of petrol that he's bought that week. Another farming collection uh, held at Nucleus, which contains a wealth of information about farm finances, is uh, collection number P566. These are records relating to the Davidson family and they owned numerous farms in Kifness, some of which were rented out. And this collection spans from 1711 through to 2018, so a really broad ranging collection, a long time period. The collection reveals the scale of the operation run by the Davidsons. Um, there are some payments being there for figures up to £163 in 1786. So that's the equivalent of around uh, fourteen thousand pounds in today's money, and it just goes to sh to illustrate what what we know that running a large scale farm has always been an expensive business. It is not uh, a a job for the the light the light hearted. Uh, it's not a sorry. It's not a an easy job. It costs a lot of money. And when I was speaking, I mentioned my colleague Anne. Uh, I was speaking with her this morning about this and. She was uh, saying a really great place to look for information about farms is in people's wills because 
they can often reveal a huge amount of information about the value of stock, the value of livestock, of equipment, uh, when somebody died. And in her, and Anne, if you're watching, forgive me, I can't remember, was it your grandfather or your great-grandfather? In that will, it showed the huge uh, value of manure, of uh, land for grazing, um, because these were all things that would have to be bought and used and would have a value on them. Now, there are a couple of unusual um, entries in those Davidson financial accounts. So, for instance, uh, mixed in with all the normal things to do with livestock and uh, wages and so on, there is a uh, purchase of a coffin and the purchase of a hearse. Now, it seems very logical to me, given what I've said, that the business and family bills would be intertwined because they also are in the Ballantrad collection, as I mentioned. But in actual fact, it's, this was seen at the time as not being appropriate because the Receiver General, who was someone uh, responsible for uh, excise, examined the records of this particular farm and noted on them that they were not properly kept as they contained particulars that were of no concern. Um, so you get the feeling that it's been, uh, yes, being told off for putting those things in. But as I say, of course, most of the entries relate to rents, to wages, to livestock and produce. And that takes us to the most central part of farming, the land, the produce of the land and the work involved to, to get that produce. The Ballantrad crop book gives us details of the 1898 crop and it reveals that this was what the, the this was what was under crop on the farm at the time. 19 acres of wheat, 34 acres, two roods and nine poles of barley, 86 acres, three roods and 13 poles of oats. And those are imperial, historic imperial land measurements. There were 10 stacks of barley, uh, sorry, 10 stacks of wheat, 21 stacks of barley and 66 stacks of oat. So it starts to give us an idea of the scale of production the page um, for, the, for August 1898 records began cutting on the 23rd of August. So this is underneath that list of uh, what crop, what was under crop. Began cutting on 23rd of August, all crop in stackyard by the 21st of September 1898. On the whole, a favourable harvest for working and the warmest September weather for some years. And the crop books for Ballantrad not only record what crops were being produced, but also the, uh, detail the way that those crops were disposed of. So in 1898, again that same year, we can see that the majority of the wheat was sold to Patterson's of Scotsburn. The bulk of the barley was also sold to a local company, but the oats, in contrast, were used, were saved up, used to feed the farm's livestock. And it gives details of how much of oats each month went to cattle, went to pigs, went to horses, and how much of it was given to local mills to be turned into meal. And there's also a link there, if you remember when we spoke about whiskey, uh, that you can see in some of these collections, the barley being produced to go to the distillers. One of my favourite document types, you'll be amazed to hear, uh, within our farming collections are the diaries written by the crofters and the farmers. And I love them because they give insights into the daily life and the reality of working on the land and the impact of the agricultural calendar and how they really show something that is, of course, very obvious, but how all-encompassing a job it is, how full-on, how many hours, how much, how multi-skilled you need to be to work on a croft or on a farm. So I'm going to look at some of these uh, diary entries along with some entries from school logbooks to show the impact of the agricultural year. So if we start uh, at the start of the farming year, we're going to look through some of its main events. And as I say, please shout if there are others that you think need to be referenced. So if we start in the spring, spring uh, sees calving and lambing, and it is one of the busiest and potentially most stressful times of year for a farmer. Long hours uh, in the spring, working into or right through the night, um, trying to ensure safe delivery 
of of lambs of calves often in in horrible weather and um, dark nights but of course it's important because farmers and crofters care about their animals they care about their livestock and also there's a potential revenue generation there if the if the lives are uh, are if the, the animals are, are born and raised safely. Yes, Jenny, I'm seeing your comment. You'd have to wonder how the crofters had time to write diaries. Well, Hugh, if you read his diary entries, you'll continue to be amazed that he had time because he seems to be so busy. It's also in the late winter and into the spring that the land is prepared for being planted and crops like uh, oats and barley and potatoes are sown. And there's an entry in the Ballantrad diary for the 21st of April 1950 and it reads clearing the last of the stones and the weeds off the battery field for the potatoes. Still not good but I have no more time to spend on it. And 1950 we're you know there's we're seeing some some mechanization there but if you think going back generations clearing the stones and the weeds is back-breaking work it's it's labor intensive and we see references to this in Hugh Lyle's diaries as well the clearing of the stones and the planting of potatoes and of course this was one of the many things that took school pupils out of school to help on the land and our school logbooks are full of references to children being absent um, to help on the land. So, for instance, the Klein logbook uh, in Sutherland, the Klein logbook for the 5th of May 1876, has this entry. Many of the children engaged in field labour, potato planting. So that's the 5th of May. But then by the 19th of May, the teacher says the average is still low field labour continues to affect attendance. In the Aldern school logbook, so we're coming down and going east a little bit towards Nairn, the Aldern school logbook of 1881, it was April rather than May that saw the bulk of the absences for this. So the 8th of April 1881, it says Tuesday was a market at Geddes, several boys absent at it. Attendance throughout the week has been bad potato planting and other country work going on. And as I say, these these school logbooks are absolutely full of references to the impact of the agricultural year, whether it's harvest, Thanksgiving festivals, um, whether it's potato planting, turnip hoeing, picking cranberries. Uh, it's such a fundamental part of everyday life. Moving into summer, and of course I'm very aware that these are very loose dates and that depending on where people lived or, or live, it will be entirely uh, different. There's a real variety in the time that things happened uh, across the country and also what the weather was doing. But generally speaking, as we come into summer, we start to get into the time of sheep shearing, haymaking and the summer shows. And Hugh's diary, Hugh Lyle's diary, refers to the sheep shearing like this and my sincere apologies for not having a Keithness accent because I think if I did this would be much more fun to read. Uh, so this is Wednesday the 29th of June. Bob and me, so that's his brother, Bob and me was at Davy Shearer's Dowsing the Lambs in the morning. In the afternoon Don, Davy and Edward MacLeod was, chip, was clipping Davy's sheep first clipping Davy's sheep first. After that we clipped our own and doused our lambs. Don and Davy was clipping with the electric, Edward was catching bob busting. Donald Shearer and me was rolling up the wool. So you get an idea there of the process of several people, someone holding the sheep, someone shearing it, talking about the electric clippers there uh, and then uh, tying up and rolling up the wool. Then the next day the 30th of June he says we was getting all the wool packed and labelled in the morning. In the afternoon I was scuffling our own potatoes and then Davy Shearer's. Davy's was bad to do. At night we went to the football in Canisby. Andrew Dundas told us that our cow Peggy was bulled by about the end of June. So again just that um, talking about the, the land, talking about um, shearing the sheep, talking about the potatoes, talking about um, making sure that the cow had been put to the bull. There's just so much going on. 
another farm collection at Nucleus is P869, which is uh, Dumbeath Mains, and it gives really detailed information about this. Um, it details that the she shearing was started out at the beginning of September by four men and two women, and by the time they went into October, it was just the women left finishing off the shearing, presumably because the men had then gone on uh, to be lifting potatoes and things. But it seems really late to us um, now to be to be shearing the sheep in October. And of course, one of the main summer activities on a farm is haymaking. And Hugh Lyle's diaries contain numerous entries about this, such as this one. August uh, Thursday the 3rd, 1967. Bob was at work with Charlie Manson, grocer van, in the afternoon. Bob cut the weeds in the top park of Laycorn next to Davies above the road. I was cutting hay. I have to cut it one way as there's a lot of clover in it. It's been a good day. Friday the 4th. It was rain first in the morning. Bob was with Charlie Manson on the grocery van. I was up at Slickly picking ewe lambs with Edward McLeod. Came home at 5pm got some food. I was cutting at night until 11pm with lights. And then the next day, in the morning, I finished cutting the hay. I cut where the corn screws go and I cut rushes at the foot of the Ten Regs Park next to Davy Shearer's below the road. The cattle broke out this morning in Davy's neeps. What gun put them back? Davy's and ours are all together in two parks. They broke out again at 1pm. I put them in and shut them in the park. Went to May at night we then went to Thurso and then went to a dance at Castleton. And then he says, it was a good day and a good night. I love that. I love how he rounds off by saying, this has been a good day. But much like that lambing at the beginning of the year, you really get a sense there of the long, hard hours of getting that harvest in and getting the hay uh, made. And of course, this was another job that the children would help with and it became more and more vital, particularly during both world wars when the number of men were so depleted um, that, that the young people would help on the farm. And the school logbook for Bernisdale, which is held in our Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre, um, has this entry for the 4th of September 1914. The attendance, in, the attendance is thin, haymaking being in full swing. Owing to the dearth of men in the harvest field, 17 are away from the district on active war service. Older children are kept at home to take their places. So you can see there that the, the, the teacher acknowledging that the men being away was having an effect on the land and the fact that the young people needed to be kept off. And he sounds relatively sympathetic about that, um, but not all the teachers were. And I wanted to share this uh, with you. This is a, a book I've spoken about before. Again, my colleague Anne, this was her book about this, uh, the history of the schools on the, uh, by Loch Ness. And this is an extract from Boleskin School. And this teacher is nowhere near as sympathetic about the fact that pupils are helping on the land. He says, this is Mr. Trail, the teacher, 1894. He says, wretched attendance all week. People are busy at peat cutting, but there is no excuse for so much illegality. If older people would just put their shoulder to the wheel and allow their children to attend school better, it would be to their credit. Why should a scholar be asked to stay at home to allow uh, the herd to, pe to wheel peats? A day would be nothing but so much absence shows carelessness. Uh, I particularly... Um, I particularly like that, you know, if the if people would just put their shoulder to the wheel. Um, and then in June 1895, another entry, he says, there are too many kept at home against the law. Fancy a boy about 10 hoeing potatoes. You get the feeling he had not, uh, he hadn't grown up in that environment himself. Um, and of course, if he didn't like that, he probably hated the next big event in the farming calendar that was about to come, which is the harvest of other crops such as potatoes. And the potato harvest was incredibly important. And as we saw last week when we were talking about food for rich and poor, for centuries, lives would actually, no exaggeration, hundreds of lives would depend on the successful potato harvest. 
and seasonal workers would be brought in to assist, and that's reflected in various collections, including in our school admission registers. You can see the number of pupils increasing around this time, and also at Martinmas, which is early November, which for many years was the time of the hiring fairs. So agricultural workers would travel to look for work, and when they found a job and settled for that uh, short period of time, the local school admissions would go up. So you can find references in unexpected places. Now, the potato lifting, of course, people, pupils were involved in until very, very recently. I think the 1980s, perhaps. I don't know if anyone else uh, has memories of doing that. I didn't, and I would have been at school in the 80s, but... Um, that's maybe just it maybe just it wasn't the case where I was so um but of course that was the reason for the October holidays the tatty picking holidays where thousands of children spent hours on the land pulling uh, and picking potatoes and Hugh's diaries and our school logbooks and there are uh, other items are full of information about this so for instance uh, the diary for Ballantrad Farm on the 13th of October 1950 reveals that on that day we started lifting potatoes. Ten Glasgow boys came under Mr McCree, one side, only about two and a half acres lifted so far. And this was also the time of year, the sheep dipping. And we can see that in again in Hugh's diaries uh, in the Ballantrad records, but also notably in this time not in our school records, but in our police records, because the police would go to attend the sheep dipping to oversee it. So again, places um, that you can find information where you might not expect it. And then, of course, as the autumn turned into the winter, the animals would be brought inside, if possible, and fed wherever needed. And this was the time that the lambs and the other stock started to be sold at auctions and markets. Um, and also winter veg, such as turnips and things, would, would be harvested. But the main, time, the main thing in the winter, going into the early spring, was the ploughing. This was the time for the land to be turned over, briefly rested, and then fertilised. Um, and then as we came into the following spring, of course, that cycle would begin again. And I'm conscious there that I've pulled some examples, and of course many of these records detail the variations of how that happened from year to year. I'm going to stop there. I hope that has been of interest. I am very, very sorry that um, my voice is so useless today. I can guarantee you it's worse for me than it is for you. Um, I hope you can join me next week where I will be looking at the subject of salmon fishing. Uh, Colin, I've just seen your message. Um, this is the book that I mentioned, Lessons by Loch Ness, which was written by my colleague Anne Fraser. And it has lots of details about uh, schools on the south side of Loch Ness and has huge numbers of references to our collections in it. A reminder before I go that this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then please do so. We're very, very grateful for that. Thank you.